Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Hello, hello. Thank you for joining me again. As I always say, I very much appreciate your ears every week. Today, we've got a very interesting topic. With me is Sabrina Lee, and she and I are going to be discussing how hearing loss can affect our cognition and what we can do about it, because that's her specialty. So thanks for joining me, Sabrina. Yeah, thank you for having me. So why don't you give us your background and then we'll dive into um, why hearing loss needs to be treated and why why it's so bad. Sure. Yeah. Um, so my name's Sabrina. I am an audiologist with Hear USA. I'm on Long Island, New York. So for any Long Island listeners, <laughs> um, I uh, did my doctorate at the University of Florida. And while I was there, I also did a lot of research into auditory perception and pitch perception and Um, how we perceive sound. And so uh, talking about hearing and aging, all that stuff is something I really like to discuss, especially with patients, because I think it's an important topic. Yeah. Well, it's definitely, I know my grandfather had, was really hard of hearing, didn't like to wear Mm -hmm. hearing aids. So, you know, the TV was turned up to just an absolutely abominable level. And I know just from what I do that when it's difficult to hear, especially if you might have a little mild hearing loss, but in a group setting, mm-hmm. it's, it's enhanced and it makes it difficult to communicate and to participate in social activities. And everybody yeah, should know that being socially active is important for our, I was going to say mental health. It is important for our mental health, but it's also important for our brain health. So yeah. uh, where would you like to start? I'm kind of interested in how, um, how we perceive Mm-hmm. Um, sounds. We can, can we touch on that just a little bit? Cause I'm curious and it's my show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, um, you know, our auditory system, I, people always ask why I went into this field and it has to do a lot with the fact that the ear is just so cool. I mean, it takes, um, quite an interesting thing. So sound is really what it is, is, is air compressing around you. And so when the air compresses and expands apart and it enters our ear, our ear is finely tuned to pick that up and kind of modify that into a neural signal. And so there are different parts of the ear that have different jobs to take that sound, make it louder, send it into our tiniest organ in our ear, which is our cochlea. And that uh, movement in the cochlea is what makes that sound an impulse that goes up to the brain and we hear it. And it happens extremely rapidly. It's happening right now, (laughs) very, very fast for many of the listeners. Um, and it does it all day, every day, and we have two whole organs doing it. And so it's a, it's a very cool system. Um, and when there is a problem in that system, it's very noticeable because if you're someone whose modality is speech, right, you spend all day listening to speech and talking, any change in that system is going to be a very noticeable and palpable change to your day-to-day life. Yeah. It's definitely not beneficial to relationships when somebody's hard of hearing. Yeah. It gets frustrating. I learned from my dad, I don't know if he, I don't know if it's just parental frustrations, but you know how when some, you'll say something and somebody doesn't hear it a hundred percent or they don't process it a hundred percent and their immediate reaction is, huh? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So that used to drive my dad right up the wall. And so he taught me to take a beat and be like, no, I don't really think I heard her say ears are going to fall off, blah, blah, blah. No, that, that doesn't sound right. Oh, wait, no, she must have said, like, give your brain a, a minute, you know, a few seconds to like reprocess what it thinks it heard. And you'd, you'd be amazed at how often just that, that breath of a beat makes it, you know, so that you're not being kind of annoying with a big, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, thanks I mean, dad for that one incredible for that yeah <laughs> i mean and he's touching on some of the you know a big crux of audiology which is hearing as a sense is also cognition right so we can pick up a sound and we can transduce that sound up to the brain but then processing it becomes a whole different story and um yeah he's definitely touching on that right there i think i knew what field he should have gone into <laughs> he was an engineer but he also did photography which was kind of an interesting combination oh, cool. Um, that's like me. I'm half entrepreneur, yeah. half artist. So, but zero engineer. <laughs> oh, I love my engineers. I did a, uh, some engineering in undergrad. And so <laughs> they're always they're the ones who know beasts. the most about my hearing aids. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, but they don't understand us artist types. So yeah, 
You know, it's <laughs> funny. We just had an um, art experience for my birthday. Mm -hmm. And I, I took two scientists and a real estate agent to a splatter room. And they oh, were very cool. reluctant. They weren't too sure about that. And it's amazing how they now understand how art is very meditative and zen. Mm -hmm. And it's like, now you can appreciate me. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> so, but back to hearing. Mm -hmm. So why is, other than what I touched on briefly at the start, why is mm -hmm. hearing loss so bad for our brains and our cognition? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I always like to start with, Research recently, they have shown a lot about this correlation, right? So hearing loss being correlated with dementia. The why question is one that researchers are really still tackling. And I think there's three major theories. There are a couple that are my favorite and one that's not so much my favorite. <laughs> um, the first one is the common cause hypothesis. So that idea is that what is causing the hearing loss is the same thing that's causing the dementia. Um, and what we find... The literature right now doesn't always support that because if you look at populations like people who are born deaf and who speak sign language as their first language, that population doesn't have a higher incidence of dementia than the regular, you know, normal hearing population. Um, but you start to see in people who were born speaking and who use hearing as their main modality, there is a higher incidence of that dementia of hearing in that population. And so why could that be? The other two theories, which I like a little bit more, and the first is cognitive load, and we kind of touched on it a little bit. Cognitive load is that if you are losing one sense, if you're losing the sense of hearing, a lot more of your day is focused on just hearing. It's focused on picking up sound and trying to collect that in order to start processing it. And the more you have to spend your mental faculties focusing on that, the less you can apply to other areas of the brain, things like executive functioning like memory recall, um, things like that, which you aren't focusing on anymore because you're struggling just to pick up the sound. And that's something called auditory fatigue. Um, the other theory is called the cascade effect. And what that talks about is when you have a breakdown in one area, it starts to cascade and affect the rest of your areas. And so um, I like to look at it as a two-parter because there's the social cascade, right? If you have hearing loss, you might feel like you wanna isolate more because you're frustrated because social interactions become harder. And when you have all that frustration, you'll pull yourself back. You might face a little more depression, some anxiety, and all of those things are taxing on your cognition and cause a reduction in cognition over time because you're spending so much energy in that self-isolation and you're not being challenged the same way you were cognitively, right? You're not having in-depth conversations with friends anymore, talking about the world or puzzles or interesting things, right? All of those things aren't happening anymore. And because of that, we start to use our brain a lot less because of it. The last part is that we're not picking up as much sound anymore. And so there's less activity in our auditory system in the brain. And because of that, the brain starts to calm down. It says, oh, I don't need to spend so much energy processing. And it starts to atrophy in that area and surrounding areas, like where our memory and our you know, executive functioning is. And so I think those theories really hit the point of, when you have a hearing loss and you lose the ability to communicate, that's when we start seeing these effects take place of dementia and, and changes in cognition. Is there any studies that you're aware of where they, they think hearing loss might be a first sign? Like my mom had horrible mm -hmm. visual processing. And for a long time, it just seemed like it was because she was not wearing her reading glasses or um, mm -hmm. she did have prescription glasses I think most of it was for reading because it hit at that age, that time of life. Um, so I, it seems logical to me that that could, you know, hearing loss could be a first sign, like the disease is affecting that particular part of your brain. Are you aware of any studies they've done that direction? Yeah, so that's a good question. And I'm not aware of any studies that particularly link it as like an early sign of it, more so that it's an early risk factor of dementia. Um, and, you know, things like when you lose visual processing, right? Some people um, say they feel like their hearing sense is heightened. But if you lose your hearing sense and your visual processing sense, then you're going to also have more difficulties in the day to day and your level of kind of dysfunction in normal conversation is going to increase. Um, where I say that I think it's a sign of risk factor, lesser so than cause, is because recently there was a study in April of this year. It was published in The Lancet. And what they did is they looked at uh, a huge data pool from the UK. I think it was like 
um, 400,000 people, or definitely more than that, but 400,000 people that they looked at. And they basically divided the group into three sections. The first section being people who had normal hearing. I think it was 2006 to 2010. Don't quote me. But, um, and they basically looked at people with normal hearing, people who had developed hearing loss but did not get it treated, and people who developed hearing loss and got it treated with hearing aids. And what they found was the people who had normal hearing had a certain risk factor for dementia. The people who developed hearing loss but didn't treat it with hearing aids had a much higher risk for the development of dementia over time. And the final group, the people who had hearing loss but wore hearing aids, treated the hearing loss early, that group still had risk factor, but it was comparable to the normal hearing individuals. So somehow they had mitigated the risk that the hearing loss presented just by wearing a hearing aid, just by treating the hearing loss itself, which shows to me that I think it's not necessarily that they're linked in a way that they're causal, the hearing loss and dementia. I think more so it's something is happening when you develop a hearing loss that is causing that atrophy to the brain and that it's something that can be avoided or, you know, really heavily addressed if you're looking to treat it. <laughs> well, it kind of also goes to, you know, early diagnosis and treatment of any mm -hmm dementia causing disease allows yeah. you to make changes. I had a, a conversation earlier today with a gal. Um, she's a future guest and she has dementia or she has Alzheimer's and she's mm -hmm. made, she made all the lifestyle choices. And I asked her point blank, do you think that those have made a difference? And she goes, Oh yes, for sure. So I'm very excited to talk to her. And I know you guys yeah. are really excited to hear from her, So, <laughs> but it's just, you know, we're, we're getting to the point where, we're starting to lose some of the stigmas and we're getting mm -hmm. earlier interventions, which obviously is also kind of an issue with hearing loss. Yeah. You know, you were telling me earlier about some like wearable hearing aid. I guess that's from the really way, <laughs> way back. Yeah, that's way, way back. Yeah. So all the way in history. I mean, there used to be some listeners might have worn it. I don't know if they had hearing loss as a child, um, but there were halter worn hearing aids where they, you know, the processor that needed to be so big because it was a complex process to pick up sound and then play it back into the ear. And so the processors needed to be worn as like a halter. <laughs> um, but now the hearing aid is so miniature <laughs> that, you know, people might be wearing them around you all day and you'd probably never notice. Um, so they've come a long, long way just on looks alone. And then when you take a look at the chip, you know, the processor that's in a modern hearing aid is so much more powerful than was ever in the halter worn hearing aid. And so um, it's kind of incredible to see how they've changed <laughs> just from a technology perspective. Yeah, I'm gonna have to Google a picture of that, and I'll try to include it in the show notes because that just yeah. that just blows. I never, I mean, I know the ones I'm familiar with the ones that went behind the ear and they were kind of chunky, yes. and you know, my grandfather didn't have any hair, so you know, he couldn't really <laughs> hide it. I could hide it, you know, with my hair, but you know, again, my husband yeah. couldn't hide it because, you know, he'd probably be tempted to grow his beard even. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> if he can get the beard up that high though, <laughs> but. <laughs> but are, I guess people aren't aware that technology is really changing. I mean, it's changing everything else. I don't know why we mm -hmm. wouldn't be aware that hearing aids have gra greatly improved, gotten smaller. You want to kind of give us like a little rundown on a modern hearing? Like, I guess there's a, f a couple of varieties, but yeah. give us, the, give us the, the high points on modern hearing aids and why we should not let that be a problem. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think barrier to entry for hearing aids for a lot of people was aesthetics, of course, um, but also that, you know, it's different from normal hearing, right? And uh, a lot of early hearing loss discussions are that a hearing aid is going to aid you, but you do still have hearing loss. And so that's something that we need to set expectations about early. But how hearing aids have changed is kind of really spectacular because they don't just take sound and make it loud. That's not the only function of a hearing aid anymore. Um, the hearing aids I work with every day, most of them are, as you were saying before uh, we started filming, they're Bluetooth compatible, so you can adjust them on your phone. Uh, most of them are rechargeable now, so you don't even need batteries anymore. Um, and so for people with dexterity issues, that has really opened up access to hearing aids a lot. Um, the chip inside of the hearing aid, it's so much more complex than it ever could have been. Um, at this point, what they most modern hearing aids do is when you enter a space, the hearing aid is scanning to figure out what space it's in. And when it detects background noise, the hearing aid itself can choose to reduce that background noise for you. 
when it hears a voice in proximity to it, it tries to raise the volume of that voice to make it more accessible to the wearer. Um, there is voice recognition software in modern hearing aids now. So if someone is in front of you and they start moving around you, the hearing aid tries to track where that person's going in the space around you so that you don't lose contact with that sound in front of you. Um, there is tinnitus addressing in hearing aids now. So for people who have problems with tinnitus, there's some ways audiologists can address that using a hearing aid. Um, there is so much <laughs> inside modern hearing aids um, that often I don't even get to with my patients because, um, you know, they're, what they're really trying to do is try as hard as possible to take that auditory fatigue component away. Because let's say you have a hearing loss where the only problem you have is loudness, where your problem is that sounds just are not loud enough for you. Wearing a hearing aid is going to do an incredible amount for you. If you're someone who has both a loudness problem and a clarity issue, let's say you say, I turn the TV up and I still don't understand it, but I can hear it. For those people, wearing a hearing aid removes the barrier of loudness, right? Because usually if it's clarity, it's both. <laughs> and then it gives you more time to focus on that clarity, to take that beat before you say, huh, and to listen and hear the message and then to process it. And so um, the idea behind them is try to make your day as seamless as possible. And I think the more um, advanced the technology gets, the closer we get to that. Yeah, I'm kind of like thinking about AI, a little AI voice in your ear yeah. <laughs> telling you, like, because <laughs> my husband's a real estate broker and the software they use for mm -hmm. property listings oh, now yeah. has where you can go in and select all the amenities of a home, four bedroom, two bath, da, da, da. And AI will write the marketing description for you, which, you know, when you've written yeah. hundreds of them, it gets really, it's like, it's a house, you know, it's got four yeah. bedrooms, two bathrooms, a garage, it's close to school, you know, it gets hard to get creative. And so he's just like, very excited. And they've got all kinds of AI platforms for podcasting. And it's just like, man, a year ago, AI was like some future thing. And now it's like a thing I yeah. use every day. <laughs> so that's where yeah. my brain's going. It's like, I wonder what AI is going to do for hearing aids. Yeah, I mean, hey, it's already started. There's one company who has an app. And uh, when you go into the app, there's actually a little buddy, and you can click on them. And if you are having troubles with your hearing aid, let's say you say today, my own voice sounds too loud, or something else that's struggling. And you can't get into the office that day or there's some barrier coming in on time. Um, what you can do is use the AI friend. He'll ask you questions about what's going on and then he'll make modifications to the hearing aid that sometimes I could make in the office. When you come back for your appointment, he gives me a report. And so I get to see what did the AI buddy change for you? And I can decide if I liked his changes, if I hated them, <laughs> I can change them. Um, and so it helps my process because if someone's in that situation and they can't articulate that they're not hearing well, they can use the software and the hearing aid to help show me why they're not hearing well instead of having to say it to me when they come into the appointment. So yeah, AI is yeah, we're, <laughs> we're all in trouble. <laughs> I mean, I've asked chat GPT questions and it's like, oh man, how long before this thing owns me? <laughs> it's just, it's... It's, you know, but I guess it just kind of baffles me. So people are still, they're resistant to hearing aids, despite, um, you know, the aesthetics being better, the technology being better. Is it just still stigma? They're not obviously yeah. not aware that it's bad for their brain. Yeah, I think, you know, as much as we talk about all of the risk factors that go along with it, I think sometimes it also just has to do a lot with coming to terms with the fact that there's a change in your system and that it's something that needs to be addressed. You know, um, I think sometimes I will delay going to a doctor just because I'm like, it's fine. I'll get over it, you know? <laughs> and I think the more we think that way, the less likely we are to reach out for these things. The other component of it is sometimes people think of, you know, the monetary risk of going and getting assessed for hearing aids. Um, at most here USAs, uh, the hearing test itself is complimentary. And so what I always tell patients is it's, you know, when you come in for the hearing test, even if you don't have a hearing loss, we've done work today towards better hearing in the future because we've set a baseline for you. We know where you're hearing now when you're starting to notice trouble with hearing. And as time goes on and as hearing struggles start to arise more and you become more of a candidate for hearing aids, we'll know when's the right time to tackle this and to start addressing it. Um, but even that barrier of coming in for a hearing test is hard to surmount. I mean, I even had 
you know, I had to kind of force my own fiance to come in here just to help me test equipment, <laughs> just because he was afraid of if what hearing loss might occur. <laughs> so, you know, it can be tough, but I think having support of the people around you to kind of say, look, I've noticed that I'm having trouble communicating with you and I want to have an easier time communicating with you because I want you in my life. That in itself can be a good way to motivate somebody to get up and just take the test to get started on the journey. Um, but yeah, it's tough for a lot of people. And I think a lot of the early appointments with patients I have is just that conversation of what is it that you're functionally missing? You know, if you come in and you say, I don't really even use my hearing, then that's a different <laughs> story than someone who says, I spend every single weekend reading to my grandchildren, or I every day teach a class <laughs> at university. And then afterwards I go and I am, you know, the advisor for a club after school, right? In those situations, if you're struggling to hear, it's noticeable. And it's something that there's a reason you decided to look into it, an audiologist. And so it's the right time <laughs> to start addressing it then. Well, it's interesting to me. Because first off, I don't know how anybody could say I don't really use my hearing. That baffles me. I mean, <laughs> I'm <laughs> that just I mean, I'm like a real visual person. I mean, we've had those goofy yeah. conversations like you know, I'd rather lose my hearing than my vision because at least I can read and yeah. watch the TV and, you know, appreciate nature. But then I'm also thinking about part of appreci appreciating nature is hearing the hummingbirds or, you know, the, we have like big owls in the trees around us. What else we got? You know, uh, well, we got the deer. They're pretty quiet. But, you know, it's <laughs> like there's there's things I just think just looking at nature isn't quite as beneficial is being able to fully experience nature or any other, you know, um, situation. I'm thinking like a, my brain wants to, it just wants to glitch today. <laughs> this is what happens when you have three Zooms in one day. You know, when you're, <laughs> it's my fault. I didn't, I didn't work my schedule quite right. Um, it's, it's okay. just, <laughs> I can't, I'm just, I'm still like, I think it's, my brain is glitching because you said somebody thinks they don't use their hearing. Yeah. Like, I could almost say that because I work from home. I have a very um, yeah. audio, acoustically adjusted room, but I either listen to podcasts or, you know, I actually really like to listen to nature sounds if I have to write. And it's like, I can't, I'm, I'm still blown away by that one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think what I've noticed a lot is people will think that they don't, right? Until they start to take stock into what their day-to-day -day is like. Um, especially, I have some patients who are retired, right? And so they say, look, I'm not working anymore. I don't really need it as a sense anymore. But then you forget that the whole point of working was to get to a point where you can enjoy your day-to-day, -day, right? And now that you're retired, um, you don't want something like hearing loss, which can be treated for the most part, you know, with a hearing aid or can be... Um, you know, amended for, so not necessarily fixed, but it can be, be helped. Um, if you're someone who's in that situation, why would you waste that time now that you have that free time to enjoy life by not hearing any of it? And I think that's always a big conversation in the office is let's talk about what, why you think you're not hearing as much. For some of those people, it's people who have had hearing loss a long time and already self-isolated, right? They've already pulled themselves away from social interactions. And so they say, well, I'm not using it anymore, but maybe let's get you back in, right? Hop back on the saddle and let's let's move you towards having more social interactions again and and helping you feel more comfortable doing so. So are part of these early conversations you're having with, you know, like maybe a first time visit, are you are you including the brain health aspect in untreated hearing loss? Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now, fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? 
Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Yeah, so we do discuss it, um, especially because often by the time patients get to me, they've had hearing loss for a long time and are maybe starting to feel some of the effects of cognition um, playing a part. Either a patient will come in who, um, you know, has dementia and who is already, you know, pretty far along in their dementia journey um, and their family members might want something to help them communicate better with that patient. Or it's people who are concerned about it, who know they have other risk factors that are for dementia and they want to address this one because it's addressable. Um, so yeah, I am often kind of uh, touching on this, the subject. And then if anyone has further questions about it, we really go in depth in it because I want everybody to understand why what they're doing right now is going to be helping them. And by knowing the why, I think people are more motivated to carry it out because the worst thing for me is when I give someone a hearing aid and then they never wear it. <laughs> so I want you to use it because buying the hearing aid is not using the hearing aid. It's not getting the benefit of the hearing aid. <laughs> yeah, it's not helping and, you out if it's sitting on the dresser or the nightstand. Exactly. That's interesting. Well, I yeah. find it interesting, and this is why I wanted to have this conversation, is because, you know, if you're not aware that it's a risk factor, then you might not, you might, you know, procrastinate, as you said, people do, mm -hmm. we all do it. Or, you know, you might just ignore it and self-isolate, like you said. So it's like mm -hmm. understanding that, like, all of our systems work together, even though we may not realize that they do or how yeah. or why. It's, you know, it's important. I've always said, I think the brain is, or, you know, they say space is the final frontier. I know I sound like mm -hmm. Star Trek, but I seriously think the brain is the final frontier because I think oh, we know 100%. more about space than we do about our brains. Yeah. And it's just, I'm just fascinated because there seems to be a lot more research and studies coming out on risk factors. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's like this gal that I talked to earlier, that's, you know, an upcoming guest. It's like, you know, maybe I should email her and say, have you been tested for hearing loss? Because that's another <laughs> risk factor you might want to avoid. <laughs> yeah. And it's tough too, because, you know, I think a big conversation around hearing aids has also been if you can afford it, right? That's a big barrier for entry for a lot of people. And I think what some people don't realize is their insurance might have coverage for hearing aids. Um, and we, I'm lucky where I am because we accept kind of most insurances. I work in New York where it's a very complex um, insurance situation. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, we'll do the work to, to try to really use your insurance benefit if it exists, because if we can make this something that's realistic for you, that's what I want. Um, and there's even now, you know, over the counter options, which I think are a great way to have a first step into the hearing world, right? If, as long as there's something in your ear that's giving you more sound in the future, if you have a complex hearing loss that needs more kind of dedicated attention and customized attention, you know, you have an audiologist to go to, but if that first step for you is just getting something off the shelf and trying it on and wearing it for a while, I am happy that you took it, right? <laughs> and so um, I think there's just a lot of options for addressing it now that it makes it so much harder to say that there's a barrier. It, it makes it harder for people to say, I don't want to do this because, um, you know, we're making it a little more accessible than it used to be. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm kind of interested in having, you know, getting tested for having a baseline because then mm -hmm. you would know, well, at least it's hard to be diagnosed with, a cognitive impairment because the doctor who maybe sees you once a year every for 15 minutes has zero clue, you know, what's gone on in the past year. And it's kind of hard to communicate that. And so when you have a, like a yeah. cognition baseline, I've got a hearing baseline. I don't, I guess too late for me on the vision baseline. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I just well, kind of feel is, like at yeah. a certain age, we just almost need to like run down the list of, okay, here's all the testing we should do just so that, you know, as we age, we know here's like at 50 years old, here's like good base. Here's where you were at 50 and now you're mm -hmm. 65 and whoa, things have changed dramatically and, and it's not necessarily just aging. I wonder if yeah. we'll ever get that direction without 
without our own personal advocacy. I think that's, oh, that's an interesting, I'm going to be contemplating on that one later. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, in some places, like, like I said here, it's, um, you know, you don't have to pay for a hearing test when you go to Hear USA, which is nice. And so, um, and you don't need a referral to, to get that hearing test done, which is good. Um, but you know, for certain things, like, let's say you're someone who you think you have normal hearing, you don't notice much difficulty, but you want a baseline. Usually what we recommend is a new hearing test every like three years or so. Um, so one year to three years. And that way you can test your baseline and test if it's changing at all. Um, sometimes they don't change. Sometimes they change very little. And so that's a good conversation to have with your audiologist on what's my direction? Where am I going? Um, if it's a noise induced hearing loss, if you're someone with a lot of noise exposure, that's usually pretty obvious on the test. <laughs> and so that's a conversation we could have of, you know, why is there a noise exposure and, and what can we do to mitigate it? Um, if you're somebody who has hearing loss, the likelihood that your hearing is going to change is much higher, is going to get worse. And so then at that point, we say annually or every couple of years for a hearing test is good just to update it. And if you use hearing aids, we can always update the hearing aids to a new test. And so um, we can keep that hearing aid current with what your hearing loss is, is doing as well. And then finally, if you're someone who has a sudden hearing loss, That's why having these conversations, I think, is really important. You know, this is not necessarily caregiving specific, but I like to talk about brain health. And I've learned mm -hmm. a bunch of interesting things in 30 minutes. Is Hear USA nationwide? Yeah. Yeah. So okay. there's, I think, uh, probably over 300 centers now or something like that all over the nation. Yeah. So well, there's, there's lots of us. <laughs> between New York and California, I think we could cover the 300 with just the two states. <laughs> <laughs> Throw in Florida and 300 is probably not enough. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's definitely a lot of Hear USAs if, if you need one for sure. <laughs> that's that's interesting. So why was it? Yeah. Why did you want to talk about hearing loss and cognition today? I'm just curious because I probably asked you that before, but I forgot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think you know it's a big topic because I think sometimes. We look at this topic in a couple of different ways. First off, some people see it as getting scared, you know, like you're being scared into treating your hearing health. Um, I see it as being precautious, right? You want to have caution with anything. And if there's a risk factor that you can mitigate somehow, I think it's a good thing to look at. Additionally, you know, there's a lot of stigma with hearing aids already. And so some people are hesitant to talk about the link between hearing loss and dementia because then people who have hearing loss may feel like admitting that hearing loss is also admitting cognitive differences and cognitive decline. And so I think it's important that we're careful about this conversation because we wanna make sure people realize that it is not a one-to-one, -one, right? If you have hearing loss, it doesn't mean you immediately are gonna have dementia. And if you have dementia, it doesn't mean you can't hear. But if there are these links that we're seeing in literature, I think anything we can do to try to mitigate that risk is gonna be really positive for people's individual futures. Um, and I think that's why, even though it's a divisive topic a little bit, or you know, maybe a little bit scary for some people, I think it's important we address it. The other half of it is there's other things we could do other than hearing aids to help mitigate the risk, and that's try to prevent hearing loss from happening from the start. If you're someone who's going to a lot of concerts or going to a lot of noisy places, earplugs are really advancing as well. I mean, <laughs> they have new ones that are filtered, and so you could still hear the concert until it gets to a point that's damaging and then it cuts out. Or if you're someone who goes to the shooting ranges, they have headphones that only cut out once a loud shot is detected by the headset. Um, and so there's ways to protect our hearing. You know, we can listen to our music a little softer, <laughs> especially on the subway. Um, all those things we can be doing to protect our hearing before we even get to this point um, and hopefully mitigating risk of dementia much later on. 
Well, I love I love learning about new risk factors, and I did know that that was <laughs> that the hearing loss was a risk factor. I didn't know maybe about getting a baseline and all that stuff, although I probably should have guessed. But I I think mm-hmm. our move so we moved from the San Francisco Bay Area up into the Sierra foothills, and both my husband and I are fairly certain. So we downsized for a couple of years, starting at the beginning of 2020. So we spent the majority of, a, of the pandemic in a house on a busy street where you could also hear another busy street. Now, the start of the pandemic was quiet as heck because nobody was going anywhere. But it just yeah. gradually, the noise increased more and more. And we have noticed that we are really sensitive to noises like the mm-hmm. landscaping noises, which we back up to a golf course. So there's always landscaping noises. And yeah. we're in a fire hazard zone. And to mm-hmm. to basically keep ha- the ability to have affordable homeowners insurance or homeowners insurance at all is to have a fire wise community, which requires a lot of tree maintenance. And I swear to God, the number of trees that they have cut down this year, I'm surprised there's any left. It's like <laughs> the house hasn't moved, but every week I hear tree cutting. And after a while, it's like, yeah. If I hear that stupid, annoying, I'm like, going to lose my mind. The amount of trees that there are in USA, it sounds like. Yeah, well, we live in a place called Lake of the Pines, and I was Ah, joking, sort of. I'm like, the rate they're going, it's going to be Lone Pine. (laughs) I mean, it's it's good. I, I would not like to experience a wildfire up close and personal that's not on my bucket list true yeah yeah, it's there's just days when it's like you know like is every neighbor having landscaping every day and it's just weird because we think we're like very sensitive to noise because we live someplace so noisy for you know about a year the first year Mm -hmm. wasn't bad the second year was like okay this is awful yeah yeah and noise sensitivity is not um something that is Uh, abnormal for people with hearing loss, actually. So what we find is that when people develop hearing loss, it's not just that they lose the ability to hear soft sounds. Um, Another effect of hearing loss is that they lose the ability to tolerate loud sounds. It's called their uncomfortable loudness levels. Um, And I've had patients, uh, particularly cochlear implant users, people who have an implant versus hearing aids, so they basically had their hearing wiped out, who didn't ha- could, weren't able to tolerate sounds just above where they could hear it. So they would hear the sound and then immediately feel pain or feel discomfort from hearing that sound. Um, and so another big thing that I like to talk about with hearing aids is that by wearing a hearing aid, you're helping to stop that process from happening because you're still giving yourself access. The idea behind it is that when you have hearing loss, you're not accessing loud sounds anymore as loud as they used to be. You know, they are still as loud to your ear, but it's not being played as loud up the brain. And so when you hear a sound that's loud, your brain kind of freaks out. It says, what is going on? And you start to feel that discomfort, you know, the turn it down (laughs) sensation comes way earlier than it did before. And so one thing, um, there's some researchers working on ways to treat, it's called hyperacusis, is uh, the sensation that you're sensitive to sounds that are, you know, not very loud for normal hearing people, but are very, very loud for you. Um, And they're looking at ways to use devices to help with that. Um, But yeah. Hearing is a weird beast, and the earlier you address it, the better you are. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. So I was telling Sabrina before we started recording, my husband and I used to DJ weddings. That's like, oh, Lord, way back in the <laughs> days when you actually used 45s, but that rapidly changed. It was We started in 1988, so it was like two turntables or two CD players, and we went with two turntables, two turntables, <laughs> two turntables, there we go, and... It would have been better to have two CD players, but regardless. So I know he's got some hearing issues. Now I'm going to have to pay attention to if the sensitivity is just that, you know, the um, yard blow, the blowers that are gas powered that are super annoying. Is that Mm -hmm. an inability to tune it out or is it just super ass annoying? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I think it's for me, I think it's B because most of the time it's like, oh my God, that noise again. And then I kind of like tune it out yeah i can go to my office too and you know it's quiet in here <laughs> except when i'm yeah. talking um but it's it's good to know that those kind of things are something i should be paying attention to because i wasn't worried about my hearing and now you kind of got me thinking so that's probably yeah. good <laughs> <laughs> and this wasn't meant to be like for me this is for everybody <laughs> i'm here for all especially you <laughs> 
Yeah. Well, one, a- one thing I always do on my fitting is I, um, I crinkle like a bag, like I take like a plastic, you know, a, a chip bag or something. And so when they put the hearing aids on, I crinkle the bag and I go, was that annoying? And they go, yes. And I say, good. Welcome. <laughs> you know, welcome back. We want things to be annoying when they're annoying. We want things to be loud when they're loud. And that's, that's the point of it all is we want to hear every gradation, every sound. <laughs> Crink- crinkling bags is my dog's yeah. favorite sound. Because it means there's a treat. I, I eat baby carrots all the time. She will come in. Now she's nine. So she's getting up there for a golden retriever. And there's days when it's like, you know, I'll get the bag out. And I'll put the carrots on the plate. And it's like, where's the dog? Oh, there's the dog. I'm like, I was beginning to think something was wrong with you. So I wonder if her hearing's getting a little, you know, she's always in the water. So I got to, I have to be careful that she doesn't get ear infections. Oh, so yeah. that's, you know, like the dog's going to want to be able to hear too. So now, now I got all these people to worry about. Because <laughs> I did not connect the hear like potential hearing loss in the dog to not immediately flinging herself off the couch when a bag is crinkled, which is normally what she does. <laughs> See, we, you know, there's all these indicators that are easy to miss. And that's why I love having these yeah. conversations. I greatly appreciate you, you coming on. Um, if yeah, somebody has a question, is there a place that they can, do they have an email they could email you or should they just contact uh, yeah. a Hear USA close to them both? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, you could do either or there's a Hear USA uh, on our website. You can actually look by, you know, region and by your zip code. And so you can find where your local center is and they'll schedule you for, you know, the free consultation appointment. Um, or if you need it, if you want to ask me a question specifically, I'm sabrina.lee at hearusa.com. Um, and feel free to reach out. I'm happy um, I think my friends are exhausted of talking about ears with me, so I'm happy to have someone else to do it with. <laughs> so you you probably know this, and I only know this because as a photographer, we had our own studio and a one-hour photo lab back in the day when we processed film. Um, mm-hmm. It was still one hour even with digital, but that was a different, whole different subject. But we did um, immigration photos. I waited passport photos too. Immigration photos are different because the entire left ear had to show yeah because ear lobes are as distinctive as fingerprints yeah and they keep growing <laughs> okay that's weird they keep going. Yeah. <laughs> i don't think i knew that one but yeah because with the ins photos it had to be a three-quarter view of the face the entire left oh, ear wow. had to be visible um some of the nationalities that you know, like to have the hair covered or, oh, yeah, that was a whole issue because, yeah. you know, you don't want to, <laughs> yeah, wanna to put one ear up. <laughs> yeah, it's like, just pull the hair back or, oh, yeah, or you got the young ladies that didn't want to, you know, mess up their hair. <laughs> it's like, yeah. It's like, trust me, it's the United States government. If you don't do it their way, even when you do it 100% right, occasionally we'd get them back and be like, this doesn't conform to the parameters. I'm like, yeah, it yeah. does. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, yeah, but yeah, it's like the, the funniest things that you learn. But yeah, ears are pretty neat. Yeah. And I, yeah, they're a very cool little guy. <laughs> well, I appreciate this. I hope we've helped educate the listeners on the importance of hearing tests and why we should not shy away from hearing aids if that's what we need, because we all want to maintain good quality of life, good brain health. And uh, if a hearing aid is going to help you do that, then don't, don't, don't. Don't hide away from them. Yeah. Don't knock it till you try it, right? <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Well, I appreciate this and um, I hope you guys have a good rest of the week. Yeah, you too. Thank you for having me. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>